Sermon, and gonna be telling us about other uses of stem cell in infertility, which is not making sperms and oocytes, but other collateral uses uh, that can be envisioned for stem cell in reproduction. So, good morning, everyone, and thanks for the introduction. So, as you heard, my talk will be about stem cell therapies and the reproductive tract. So, uh, how do I go forward with this? Okay. So I have nothing to disclose, and these are the learning objective, objectives of my talk. So I will give an overview of the most common dysfunction of the reproductive tract from both the male and female sides. Then I will give an overview of the treatments for erectile dysfunction with stem cell, uh, with the stem cell transplantation in both animal models and humans. I will give an overview of the ongoing human clinical trials in erectile dysfunction uh, treatments, and uh, some I will give uh, an overview on the stem cell treatments for uterine and vaginal regeneration, and I will try to give some insight on the possible mechanism of action of the transplanted cells. So let's start from the reproductive tract dysfunction from the male side. So the most common reproductive dysfunction of the males is the erectile dysfunction. This dysfunction can be caused by a great amount of uh, diseases. So as you can see listed here on the right, can derive from diabetes, hypogonadism, peroni disease, or other diseases. It can arise also from uh, injuries, such as the pelvic nerve injury, but it can develop also due to high levels of stress or it develops due to high to advanced age of people. So the main feature of the erectile dysfunction is the, a decreased intracavernal pressure. So it means an impaired blood flow that causes the erectile dysfunction. On top, we see impairment in the nitric oxide pathways that uh, as well are related to the vasodilation and an increase in the blood flow. We observe <gasps> damages at the level of nerves, but also at the level of endothelial and smooth muscle cells. So we observe an increased apopt apoptosis of these cells. And concomitantly, we observe also an increase in collagen production and the um, appearance of fibrosis. The female side is a bit more difficult, of course, because there can be uterine, uterine abnormalities and vaginal dysfunctions as well. The uterine, uterine abnormalities, they can arise from, again, a very wide range of diseases, and pro also from post-operatory complications or traumas, and the most common disease probably is the Asherman syndrome, which is related to the dysfunctional endometrium. And uh, with uh, these abnormalities includes, for example, interuterine adhesions, fibrosis, uh, a damage in the basal layer, or all the, all the problems related to the, metrum, to the endometrium. So at atrophy of the endometrium, no regeneration, and all the other endometriotic problems. Also in the vaginal dysfunction, we observe uh, some typical features that are endothelial and muscular cells dysfunction. So we observe an increased apoptosis of these cells, and often we observe the presence of scars and fibrosis. This, all this dysfunction can be caused by vaginal prolapse, fistula, or again, trauma surgery. On top, there is the meyer rokitansky kurster hauser syndrome, which is a syndrome where the people do not develop a vagina, so they are lacking, actually, the, the whole organ. There are already therapeutic options, as you for sure know, for both male and females. For example, in the treatment of erectile dysfunction, we have three lines of treatment. So we start from the oral pharmacological therapy, which is uh, composed of the very famous sildenafil, or also Viagra named, which is uh, an inhibitor of the phosphodiesterases 5, which goes and promotes the, the pathway of the nitric oxide, increasing again the erectile function of the, of the organ. This line, this therapy did not work on all the patients, so if it doesn't work, we have to go to more aggressive, let's say, treatments that can go from, well, different drugs, so alpostadil, or we can go through intracavernal injections, vacuum pumps, or the third line uh, medication in include very aggressive treatments, such as the penile implant or corrective but the vascular surgery. Also for uterine and vaginal dysfunction, there are already many different uh, therapies available and include normally they include surgery so we have, um, we, have we can have serial flexible hysteroscopies or we have or we can have the graph of uh, for example fresh amnion or intrauterine devices in general we can also do deletion curettage for the endometrial scraping and we can also go uh, in very difficult cases to the uterine transplantation but this will be discussed further in the pre-congress also for vaginal dysfunction in general, there are, there, this is, involves the surgical reconstruction with synthetic or biological scaffolds. So all these treatments are effective, 
but uh, the thing is that they are very aggressive because surgery is, is good, but still that can have uh, some drawbacks such as uh, rejection of the, of the graft, uh, some inflammation or infection. So many people thought about using stem cells to approach this with, for an alternative approach for this, the treatment of these diseases. So a few words about stem cells, as well, Bjorn said extensively before, we have the main difference in stem cells is between pluripotent stem cells and adult stem cells. The pluripotent stem cells are normally derived from the zygote, so from the, uh, from the, zygote, from the ICM of the blastocyst, and these cells show uh, the highest proliferation potential, so a virtually indefinite proliferation potential. They can differentiate into all the cell types of the three germ layers, but they also have some drawbacks, such as they, if they're transplanted, they can cause immunogenicity, or they can lead to the teratoma formation. So for clinical application, they're still a bit dangerous, as we pointed out before. From the other side, from the adult, we can derive many different kinds of adult stem cells. These cells have a relatively lower proliferation compared to the pluripotent one, and can differentiate into less cell type, let's say, some more specific cell types. But they have some very nice feature, which is like the suppression of immune response. So they induce tolerance, for example, of a graft. And also they promote vasculogenesis. So they're more, maybe more useful, let's say, for the purposes I'm going to discuss about later. This adult stem cell, as you can see, there are many, and they depend, uh, they're dependent on the organ where they are derived from. So we can have mesenchymal stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells, neural stem cells, intestinal stem cells, and many others. So the applications of the stem cells are yeah, uh, mainly three. So we can have the regenerative medicine where we take our stem cells, we differentiate them into a certain tissue and we transplant the tissue or we transplant the stem cells in a damaged tissue and they participate into, re into the regeneration of the organ. But we can also go for disease modeling, meaning we, have a, we take cells from a patient and then we study in vitro the, the development of these diseases and all, we can do all these kind of functional studies without uh, going to animal studies or human studies, so we save some time and money. And on top, we can also do the toxicity testing of drug discovery. So we have, for example, we, we can take stem cells, we can derive them, we can differentiate them to hepatocytes and test uh, a different amount of drugs to see if they induce or less or not hepatic toxicity, or we can also try to test some drugs and to see in our cell model if the drug can be useful. So again, to save money and time for the subsequent steps of the um, drug discovery process, which is very long and expensive. So this, why? What is the rationale between for the stem cell transplantation and the erectile dysfunction treatment? So as I said, the fibrosis, loss of endothelial and muscular cells are the hallmark of the erectile dysfunction. From the other side, the adult stem cells are known to secrete these anti-immunogenic factors and they generally reduce the inflammation and the fibrosis processing and they promote angiogenesis. On top, they can differentiate in many different cell types. So, in theory, the direct transplantation of the cells into the damaged corpus cavernosus should be restoring or improve at least the functionality of the organ. So, this is a, well, this is a very complicated table. This is from a meta-analysis that was made in last year, in 2015, and it evaluates the intracavernosal injection of stem cells in rat models of erectile dysfunction. So here you see all the studies, but the thing that I want to show is just that there are many studies, and all of them evaluate different kind of cells. So there's, for example, bone marrow mononuclear cells or adipose-derived stem cells. Uh, bone marrow derived stem cells, uh, stromal vascular fraction, and many other kind of adult cells. On top, this, all these treatments were made in, com not always, but sometimes in combination with other molecules such as BNDF uh, or the fibrin sealant or NGF or beta FGF. So there are many different kind of approaches that have been tried. In Overall, you see this is the forest plot indicating the relative increase in the intracavernosal pressure, so let's say the most important parameter when considering erectile dysfunction. And you see all the studies, this is the baseline at zero, almost well, all the studies show an improvement, some studies more and some studies less, but this seems quite promising. In, in particular, we see that cells modified with NGF yield in two independent studies yield the best uh, improvement, let's say, for the erectile function. So since the, the studies were quite positively and encouraging for in animals, some, ah, this is, sorry, it's another example of the, 
of the findings that are in all those papers. In general, we find all the same things, which, is, which means an increase in the intracavernosal pleasure. We observe a higher smooth muscle content. As you can see, this is an example. These are uh, erectile dysfunction rats treated with uh, adipose-derived stem cells or adipose-derived stem cells treat, uh, modified with hepatocyte growth factor. So you see that this is the normal situation. In red, you see the muscle tissue. And you see that in the erectile dysfunction model, so the negative control, there, are, there is not really a lot of muscular tissue. While when we treat with adipose stem cells, we observe an increase in the muscle content. As you can see, this is the graph representing the picture. So there is an increase. And it seems that also the modification with the hepatocyte growth factor yields a better uh, production of muscle. And the ratio muscle to collagen is better. Where they also in, uh, detect normally a decrease in apoptosis um, and a higher expression of the nitric oxide uh, synthesis genes. So, as you can see here, the endothelial nitric oxide synthesis uh, in, is highly expressed relative to the negative control. This is the picture. So, you see uh, the staining is not very clear. So, yeah, you can see from the negative control we have a higher expression in adipose derived stem cell treated rats. And also here it seems that the hepatocyte growth factor yield a better, uh, let's say, gives a better upregulation of the synthesis. On top, we also observe um, upregulation of smooth, mu smooth mu muscle actin. So we have a higher muscle production. But something very important, in my opinion, that in general, in all the papers, is found that few or no cells are found back in the tissue after one month or at a later time point. So this is something we should consider for later on. Well, as I said, uh, the studies were very promising in animals, so they, they were translated actually to humans. And some clinical trials, phase one, two, so safety, they, they are started. As you can see, I just listed them all here. This is the one that I found in the clinicaltrial.gov's website. And as you can see again here, there is a transplantation of uh, adult cells, so adipose derived stem cells, uh, mesenchymal stem cells in general, bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells, and all these kind of adult cells that we also saw before. There is just one uh, report of the clinical trial, so the, the report of the phase one, so the safety, which is the study that you see here, the safety of intracavernous bone marrow monoclear cell in erectile dysfunction. And the results are shown in the, in the table here. So some patient, the patients were treated uh, with the um, injection of these cells, and they were monitored for six months. And as you can see here, the values of the baseline, these are all the parameters of the International Index of Erectile Function. As you can see here, this is after six months, so the later time point of evaluation. You see that the p-value, the in bold, is the indicated the statistical significance. So we have an improvement in a lot of these parameters. So we see that this therapy seems to be, apart from safe, so the safety was proven, it seems to be also effective in the restoration of the erectile function in humans after six months. So th these results are quite encouraging. Also, the um, nitric oxide uh, release test, it's an important parameter, and it's upregulated up to six months. So what are the mechanisms that are promoting this better erectile function? Uh, these two studies, I think, they can explain a bit better what's the effect, because in the first one, they compared the adipose-derived stem cells, so a pure population of stem cells, and the stromal vascular fraction. The stromal vascular fraction is, a, let's say, a cocktail of different cells, different molecules, and different matrices. So it represents, let's say, a less pure population of stem cells. When they went to evaluate the, the effect on the restoration of erectile function, they saw, as you can see here, this is the intracavernosal pressure, the control, and the, these two are actually giving the same results. So we see a correspondence between the stromal vascular fraction and the adipose-derived stem cells. In the paper on the right, you see a very nice study where they used the, the injection of adipose-derived stem cells for treating the erectile function, but they did two groups. In one group, they transplanted the adipose-derived stem cells, and in the second group, they took the same stem cells and they lysated them before transplanting. So they basically put a cocktail, not the cells. And what they found was actually that the, adi the adipose stem cell lysate yielded the same effect, a bit less, but still statistically not significant lower, than the adipose derived stem cells. So if the lysate gives the same effect of the, of the stem cells, it means that the effect is more due to the apocrine mechanism, and it's due to the, all the cytokines and all the secretome of these cells that promotes the regeneration. But it's not really due to an engraftment of these cells. 
And this is something that we have to take into account because the optimal, the optimum would be that our cells go migrate into the damaged area and they integrate and they promote the, the, the erectile function. But it seems that rather here it's more the effect of the, their secretome. So we are giving some kind of drugs, not really a stem cell therapy. So concluding, the preclinical studies show a general improvement in the erectile function of rats, mice and rabbits also, even if they didn't show it. The stem cells are able to reduce fibrosis, they promote the vascularization, and they ex ex increase the expression of key regulators in the erectile function. As I just said, most of the studies didn't show transplanted cells surviving after one month in the host. And this points toward the paracrine mechanism of, of action and due to the secretome again and all the cytokines that these cells produce. The clinical trial that I showed it gives a very quite positive indication because it shows an improvement here in the erectile function even after six months follow-up. So these results are quite promising in the, let's say, in the treatment of erectile dysfunction. But what about the female side? The stem cell have been tried, of course, in the uterine, uterine restoration and endometrial regeneration especially. So, here I reported two different approaches that have been tried. So it's the direct infusion of cells or the cells uh, seated on a scaffold and the scaffold transplanted to the, um, to the host. So here you can see in the left, they, the, this author used the rat model of a thin endometrium. So you can see here, this is the thinner endometrium of the control group, let's say. This is the normal situation. And they treated these uh, rats with uh, bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells. And you can, as you can see in the experimental group, we have a thickening of the endometrium. On top, they, this author saw that after the, the transplantation, they saw an upregulation of beta-FGF and interleukin-6, which are anti-inflammatory cytokines, and a downregulation of TNF-alpha and interleukin-1-beta, which is the pro-inflammatory cytokine. So everything points toward a mechanism of reduced inflammation. On the right, there is the other approach, which is cells on a scaffold. It's a bit more complicated, but it's very promising. This is one example of one of the first papers that they developed the uterine matrix. So they took uterine tissue from rats. They perfunded it with SDS, and they, so to decellularize it. They, after they obtained this decellularized matrix, they seeded the cells again, and they went to see if this scaffold was uh, improving the uterine regeneration. So what they did was making these two groups, this is the normal situation, and they took the uterine, the rat horn, the rat uteri, and they made its excision, so there is an excision only group, and in the other group they made the excision and they transplanted the scaffold together in the, in the, ex, in the excision uh, site. As you can see here, this is a staining for Desmin, and uh, they showed that after the transplantation of the scaffold, they had a much better pregnancy rate in the uterine horn, a much less problems. As you can see, these are the excision-only groups, so these uteri are not really nice. And these are already obtaining pregnancies. So both, let's say, the approaches showed an improvement in the, in the uterine quality. What about the Usherman syndrome? Because, it's, as I said, it's one of the most common uh, endometrial diseases. In, um, now, the first paper, this is a paper from the group of Carlos Simon, and it shows the reconstruction of endometrial tissue from human endometrial side population cell lines. So the side population cell line, it can be considered an endometrial stem cell line. So they, took, they derived these cells, they characterized them, and then they transplanted under the kidney capsule in, uh, in mice, and then they went to see the, the resulting tissue that form. As you can see here, there is the clear division between the kidney and the tissue that is formed. This, this tissue seems an endometrial tissue. And actually, they confirmed it also by staining for Bimentin. And as you can see here, there is still the division between the kidney and the reconstructed endometrium. So they prove that the reconstruction of the endometrium is possible, at least in this model. Something about uh, human, also because something has been done in humans. This is a study from 2014. So they did an autologous stem cell transplantation in uh, Asherman syndrome. So they took uh, six patients only with a refractory Asherman syndrome. They, they took their blood, let's say, stem cells, and they transplanted uh, autologous stem cells in the endometrium to monitor if the, the thickness of the endometrium was improving or not. As you can see, in this graph, there is the, the follow-up is up to nine, 10 months. And you see the, there is an endometrial thickening. So it increases by 
almost fivefold. So it's very positive because the, all the patients consistently show the a thickening, but also and, and also up to 10 months, so it's a very relevant finding. But the authors still say that the, the, thick, the thickness of the endometrium was not enough for uh, an IVF treatment. So these results, again, are positive, but not yet there. There, there is still something that, that, that has to be done to, to make it real and possible. Again, what's the mechanism of action of these cells that we just showed? In here, the situation seems a bit more dif as a bit different than the, uh, regarding erectile dysfunction because, for example, here in the paper on the left, uh, they come to the conclusion that no transplanted cells contributed to the repopulation to the of the endometrium. So what they did was basically transplanting uh, male stem cells, and then when they went to check the endometrial tissue, they went to fish for the Y chromosome, and they say they didn't find any cell with a Y chromosome, so no cell of uh, transplanted was actively integrated in the tissue. From the other side, we have another paper, so the one you see on the right, where they did, a, in a similar setup, they did find the Y chromosome, so they did find some cells that integrate in the tissue. You can see these two are, well, positive controls, and when you see the regenerated endometrium, let's say, you see, well, not many, but some cells that contribute to the different parts, and they can differentiate into different cell types, but still are actively involved in the repopulation of the endometrium. So the situation, maybe because of the, differ the, differ the difference between the penile tissue and the endometrium, made this uh, action of the stem cell that we transplant a bit different. In, which, in fact, we, it seems that here we have actually an integration and a differentiation of the stem cell that we used. So, other side, what about stem cell transplantation in vaginal dysfunction? In a similar fashion to what it was observed before, in this paper that I'm showing here, we, they saw that bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells could become vaginal stem cells and they can accelerate the vaginal reconstruction. So in this setup, they took, um, they ablated the, the, the vagina of rats and they transplanted that submucosan intestinal scaffold in the place of the vagina and they observed the normal regeneration of the organ uh, in presence of the scaffold. As you can see here, the epi epithelial layer cannot regenerate properly after 20 days. Also the muscle staining indicates some problems and uh, this is a staining for the cytokeratin. And you see that, the, that this is not an, optim an optimal situation. When they did the transplantation of the scaffold together with the mesenchymal stem cells, they show something very nice here. You can see that the epithelial formation is, is quicker and it's more resembling the physiological function and the physiological uh, situation of the vagina. We can see at 30 days also just the scaffold yields some kind of regeneration, so the tissue seems regenerated, but again when we compare it with the mesenchymal stem cells, the the formation is way more similar to the physiological um, situation found in the vagina. So again, here we see how the, the, the stem cell transplanted help in uh, both repairing and accelerating the repair, which is a very critical point because when we go for yeah, the treatment of wound and all those kind of problems, the, the timing is very important also of the healing process. And yeah, I would also like to say something about this, which is not really, they didn't really use stem cells, so it's not really stem cell related, but it's the tissue engineering for the vaginal reconstruction. This is a very nice paper, which was from 2014, published in The Lancet. It's the group of Anthony Atala.
and there, they substantially developed artificial organs, so they took a biocompatible scaffold, they seeded with epithelial and muscular, and muscular cells, they incubated the organ to give time to the cells to engraft and proliferate, and after they transferred these artificial organs to four patients with the, with the absence of a vagina, let's say with the MRKI syndrome that I described before, so without vagina. And we can see here at the beginning of the treatment, so okay, and this the last row, we, we see a, an eight year follow up, so a very long follow up. And all those four patients after eight years tolerated the graft and developed a pretty much functional vagina. So it's really, this is really a stunning result. This group already managed to develop an artificial bladder and they're working also on artificial penile tissue now, but it's still ongoing. But yeah, this, this is really an impressive, an impressive result because from having no vagina, so it's not really artificial, uh, having no vagina, this patient developed a, a functioning vagina. So maybe this is, can be the way to go also for stem cell treatments. Maybe integrating tissue engineering and stem cell treatment can be uh, a, positive, a positive thing. So summarizing everything, the stem cell transplantation is a promising tool to regenerate the reproductive organs, and that, that is sure. These cells have been proven to ameliorating yeah, the corpus cavernosum physiology, but also to regenerate uh, dysfunctional endometrium and uh, also promote in general vaginal regeneration and reconstruction. Although this is very positive, there is still evidence that the action is not due to really to an engraftment and differentiation process, but rather to cytokine secretion. So this is still something that we have to work on. And the studies in human are still few. And they are promising, as I showed you, the, the clinical trial is promising, but they are only few. So, of course, further research is needed to improve all the engraftment and survival of the transplanted cell, to have an ideal stem cell therapy and not something that is more related to a cytokine that we go to treat the patients with. Okay, so I would like to thank all my, yeah, the research group, Reproduction and Genetics, and in particular Karen Sermon and uh, Claudia Spitz, that is my promoter, and the uh, CISMA Reproductive Medicine Unit with Luca Gianaroli, and of course Escher for giving me this chance, and in particular Rita for being always so supportive. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Um, Especially in the um, erectile dysfunction studies, it seems it, it's actually a little bit of a leitmotif all over when even in other areas of medicine where, let's say, adult or mesenchymal stem cells are used, it seems to be that the effect is really mediated by the cells but acted by um, cytokine or modulators. So uh, do you know if there are any studies that uh, try to understand what is the cocktail of modulator that they can be used, they could be used, instead of using cells with all the problems involved in using cells, mm -hmm. just using, I don't know, supernatant or just a mixture of certain modulators to well, do the same. Yeah, there are, there are many studies that are doing this kind of trial. So let's say we use the, some, they say let's use a conditioned medium. So if you take the medium where you culture just your stem cells and then you transplant it. The, the effects are not really great because I think once, one thing that is positive is that the stem cells, if you transplant to a wounded area, let's say, they will home there and then they will secrete their cytokine. So maybe the effect is more direct. But the, a real cocktail that is working with, the, let's say, like conditioned medium or that someone identified specific factors that can be used as a like pharmacological therapy and not stem cell therapy, I'm not really aware of those. And, and, and so the use of scaffolds, you think that would um, maximize the time of contact of the cells on the, on the area where they're needed and therefore well, yeah. automatically improve results? Yeah, I think something very important is also the niche. Well, it is very important, the niche. And the scaffold can provide an ideal environment where the cells, let's say, adapt at the beginning. And then when the scaffold is transplanted, they have already the 3D structure, let's say, to, to, yeah, to, to act in a better way, let's say. So if they have already the right, um, the right structure, they can make a better effect. So yeah, I think definitely the, the scaffolds will be very important, depending also on the tissue, because like endometrial 
in the meta regeneration, it's a bit weird to use scaffolds, but for penile uh, regeneration, I think it's the way to go. Um, the study uh, where they have used these uh, stem cells for endometrium, thin, mm -hmm. uh, thin endometrium, um, do they show that the decidualization, so the functional biosensing function of the endometrium is, is also restored? Have they tested no. that? No, or they just, they, they see just it? saw the, they just reported the thickening and they checked some molecules, so they said, look, we have an, an upregulation of the market that I told you, so it seems that it's better, but they didn't do the proper functional studies. Indeed, they're lacking in those papers. Okay. If you can come here, please. Just have one comment uh, about the vaginal reconstruction is that it's actually no need for that because there are some very effective dilatation methods and uh, in these cases of course if you do if you put a grafter and you start with the intercourse you don't really know in the end after six years how, how much is due to the graft and how much is due to the dilatation. So I think there's no place actually to, to for, for vaginal constructs in clinical medicine today with the effective uh, dilatation methods. Also the Vecchietti laparoscopic procedure. But in patient with the uh absent to complete absence of vagina, can you still develop a fun yes. functional vagina with those? Uh, with lap laparoscopic uh, procedure to develop, develop one actually in nine days uh, by a procedure and then it's re during three months uh, oh. and they, they can be as little as this from the beginning. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> In that specific paper, if yeah. I'm correct, it's flushing of the stem cells, but other papers also did the subendometrial injection of in specific places, but that it seems to be not really different. Also because the outcome that they evaluated is quite, yeah, quite macroscopic. It's like the thickening of the endometrium. So it seems that both the, the ways are explored and seems to be quite similar. We still, we still have some time before lunch break, so if uh, um, Sam has questions on the other topics that have been discussed today and didn't have time or didn't think about, then you are of course welcome to ask since the speakers are here, well, three of them at least. I still have a question for, for, uh, for you. Um, it's a little bit related to the first question uh, asked. Um, if you use stem cells, um, the legal frame is a lot more stringent than if you would use lysates or, or chemical compounds. Um, so as you have shown, some studies show that actually the regeneration of certain tissues are quite similar if you use extracts um, or cocktails of compounds instead of re really using the stem cells. So why would you go through all the hassle because the legal side of using stem cells is a lot more stringent than, than going through a compound drug related uh, therapy. So what is your opinion on that? Well, actually absolutely agree because in my opinion what we are seeing now, the improvement of the erectile function that I showed is indeed due to, to drugs. So we are not there yet with us. That is not a proper stem cell therapy. I absolutely agree, since the stem cell treatments are so complex and strict in the regulations, probably with, the, with some, what, some drugs derived from the stem cells, it would be indeed better. So that's why I wanted to stress that we are still not there because we see a positive effect, but what gives this positive effect is not really what we want. So I think we, we'll, we really have to research a lot more because if this is the final effect that we can get, it's indeed better to go for pharmacological treatments. 
Okay, so thank you very much for your presentation.